Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you have a fantastic Friday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. This week I decided for this Friday show, I wanted to cover a lot of stories that people have been recommending. Some we actually planned to put in the show, but it made it too long, or it was gonna make the show late if we actually covered it. And we'll start things off today with one of the craziest stories I saw this week, and it comes out of India. So according to police, on November 27th, Swathi Reddy injected her husband, Sudhakar, with an anesthetic. Then, after he lost consciousness, she and her secret boyfriend, Rajesh, beat him to death with an iron rod. The pair then partially burn his body, they dump it in a a nearby forest. Then, in a staged attack, the woman poured acid on her secret lover's face, hoping that after disfiguring his face, he could pass as her husband and get a cosmetic surgery to transform his face even further. She told her husband's family that four people broke into the house, they attacked him with acid. Mr. Reddy's parents believed the story, they began paying the medical bills. But as his burns began healing, they became concerned that he wasn't their son. He couldn't remember information about his family, he showed behavioral differences. Fearing that he was going to be exposed, the boyfriend then pretended he could not speak and he could only communicate through writing, but still, the husband's brother just felt like there was something that was off. He found it even more odd that for some reason his brother registered at the hospital as a vegetarian, he wasn't before this acid attack, and so eventually the family files a complaint with police, the police look into it. After changing her story multiple times, Swathi then finally cracks, she admits everything. Apparently she and her boyfriend had been spotted together, her husband had accused her of having an affair. She said she was worried that the secret relationship would be exposed, and so they went through with this crazy, bizarre plan. And so the woman's been arrested, once the boyfriend's out of the hospital, he'll be arrested. And I don't know how to end that story. I feel like I need to take a shower. I also thought in the past that I had dated crazy. Turns out, no. At most, I've dated knock on your door at three o'clock in the morning crazy, but never throw acid in your face. Or honestly, be cool with someone throwing acid on their face crazy. Yeah, I got no ending. The world is scary, guys. Then we had a lot of people wanting me to talk about the situation with Dr. Disrespect. If you don't know him, he's a streamer on Twitch. He's in fact one of the most popular streamers in the world. This year, he won streamer of the year. And the reason he's in the news today is on his last stream, he broke character and he came out and told his audience that he had been unfaithful to his wife. And I just want to be completely transparent with you guys. As you guys know, I have a, a beautiful family and a wife and kid. And um, I want to be transparent that I've been unfaithful. And the reaction online as a whole to this news has seemed split. Some people glad that he's being honest and transparent with his audience, that he's taking the time to take care of his family rather than just focus on work. Others disgusted, disappointed, angry at him. And I mention this story because in our current climate, it seems like now men are getting out in front of potentially being exposed. Because obviously when you look at the situation with Dr. Disrespect, why is he announcing this on a live stream? Does he just have that kind of connection with his audience? Did his wife want him to do it? Did he want to get out ahead in front of this because maybe someone else was going to expose him? By getting out in front of it, you can potentially soften the impact. Because this move isn't an isolated incident. I mean, in fact, just this week, it's at a different severity level, but Morgan Spurlock exposed himself. He's the filmmaker behind Super Size Me and several other docs. He wrote, I've come to understand after months of these revelations that I am not some innocent bystander. I am also part of the problem. If I'm going to truly represent myself as someone who has built a career on finding the truth, then it's time for me to be truthful as well. Any references calling his female assistant hot pants, sex pants. He also says that he's been unfaithful to every girlfriend and wife he has had. He then describes a situation where the, the woman he was having sex with accused him of rape. Writing, when I was in college, a girl who I hooked up with on a one night stand accused me of rape. Not outright. There were no charges or investigations, but she wrote about the instance in a short story writing class. There were no charges or investigations. He described the situation saying, we began fooling around. She pushed me off. Then we laid in the bed and talked and laughed some more and then began fooling around again. We took off our clothes. She said she didn't want to have sex. So we laid together, talked and kissed and laughed. And then we started having sex. But then he said she began to cry. He said he didn't know what to do. Saying, we stopped having sex and I rolled beside her. I tried to comfort her. To make her feel better, I thought I was doing okay. I believe she was feeling better. She believed she was raped. That's why I'm part of the problem. And so understandably, a lot of people are, are questioning the intent of these people that are coming out in front of him. I mean, Morgan Spurlock even wrote, I wonder when they will come for me. That sentence makes it feel self-serving, PR-based. I guess I just want to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts around stories like this? Does it feel empty and fake, or you think, no, it, it's good a person's getting in front of it, having a conversation with their audience? Yeah. I just love to know your thoughts here, because it seems like, just in general, the internet is all over the place here. Then in Harvey Weinstein's sexual harassment news, Salma Hayek is his newest accuser. On Wednesday, she put out a piece in the New York Times titled, Harvey Weinstein is my monster too. In it, she details years of abuse from Weinstein. It starts off saying initially Weinstein was a dream come true for Salma, talking about how she went from being a schoolgirl in Mexico to then being in soap operas and being given roles in US films. How Harvey Weinstein even greenlit her dream film, that being the 2002 film Frida. And she says, Harvey had taken a chance on me and nobody. He said yes. Little did I know it would become my turn to say no. No to me taking a shower 
shower with him. No to letting him watch me take a shower. No to letting him give me a massage. No to letting a naked friend of his give me a massage. No to letting him give me oral sex. No to my getting naked with another woman. No, 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 no. She then details his fits of rage when she would say no. It would range from sweet talk all the way to I will kill you, don't think I can't. Saying he held all these no's over her head. Scrapping her dream film, Freedom, multiple times. One of the times she said he demanded a female sex scene where Sama would be required to show full frontal. Saying without that scene he was going to scrap it. Sama saying she felt pressure to do the scene. She was sobbing uncontrollably. She had a panic attack before the scene. She threw up. And she ended up doing the scene saying, but this time it was clear to me he would never let me finish the movie without him having his fantasy one way or another. There was no room for negotiation. I had to say yes. Then even after she did it, when the movie was done, Harvey demanded the movie go to video. It did end up getting shown in a handful of theaters and ended up winning Oscars. And it is important to note Harvey Weinstein's lawyer has responded to this piece, saying that any sexual contact with Harvey and anyone has always been consensual, adding Mr. Weinstein does not recall pressuring Selma to do a gratuitous sex scene with a female co-star, and he was not there for the filming. However, that was part of the story as Frida Kahlo was bisexual. Which is quick note, that's a very weird defense. Mr. Weinstein obviously didn't pressure Selma Hayek into doing a nude scene because he couldn't even be there to watch it live. Even though it was obviously being filmed on video and whether it went into the final cut or not, he would see it. Also, the however that was part of the story. Just because someone's bisexual doesn't mean that a scene warrants Salma Hayek definitely being topless. Like, who would watch an intimate scene in that movie and be like, ugh, I would believe it, but I, I see zero nipples. It just seems like Hollywood trickery, hashtag fake news. And that's where we are as of right now, and it just, it still blows my mind that there are still Weinstein stories coming out. I mean, I guess I shouldn't be surprised because he's been in the business in such a power position for such a long time. And personally, I don't think we're even in a situation where everyone he's ever done something to is going to come forward. It just makes me wonder, what is the real number? So how many more accusations will come out? I don't know, it's it's wild to me. Then I wanna talk about a crazy update with the Rohingya. If you want more detailed background, I'll link to a video down below and we talked about this last, but just in case here's some base level background. In Myanmar, there are over 100 ethnic groups. One of those is the Rohingya. And while they've lived in the western state of Rakhine for hundreds of years, they are not citizens of Myanmar. Instead, they're viewed as illegal immigrants from Bangladesh and they've been called the forgotten people. Their status also means that they're not technically free to travel. They have no access to healthcare, to schools. And after decades of targeted attacks on the Rohingya people, in August, the Iraq and Rohingya Salvation Army, ARSA, retaliated and attacked a government border outpost. This then led to the army moving from town to town, wiping out the Rohingya. Reports saying more than half a million Rohingya have fled to Bangladesh to escape these attacks. At the time, the government denied any wrongdoing, saying they were just fighting terrorists. But in general, most of the world has not bought that argument. We also have new information. Up until now, the death count from the initial clashes was reported as 400. This coming from the country's military commander's Facebook. Well, now we have a report from Doctors Without Borders that estimate that at least 6,700 Rohingya were killed in Myanmar in the August conflict. Sidney Wong, their medical director, is saying they conducted six rounds of surveys with survivors. They had a sample population of 600,000, and from that data, they found that at least 9,000 Rohingya died between August 25th and September 24th. And of those, 71.7% were caused by violence. Wong adding, What we uncovered was staggering, both in terms of the numbers of people who reported a family member died as a result of violence, and the horrific ways in which they said they were killed or severely injured. The number of deaths are likely to be an underestimation as we have not surveyed all refugee settlements in Bangladesh, and because the surveys don't account for the families who never made it out of Myanmar. The report also says that at least 730 Rohingya children under five years old were killed violently based on the most conservative estimations. 59% of the children were shot, 15 were burned to death, seven were beaten to death, and two were victims of landmine blasts. There's also other incredibly concerning, horrible news. Reports started coming out in the beginning of December that Rohingya women that fled to Bangladesh were being sold as sex slaves. Aid agencies saying that girls as young as 13 were picked up by traffickers. I mean, we're talking about young girls and women on their way to refugee camps. Also, the UN and aid agencies saying that sex trafficking is actually happening in refugee camps. And I will say, I am honestly surprised we're not hearing more about this on TV. This is a situation that our United States House of Representatives has identified as ethnic cleansing. And I'm also unsure of what the international community is trying to do. In the UN, the General Assembly has passed one draft resolution, but it really has no teeth. The Security Council has only expressed concern, but there haven't really been any meaningful moves. This is just still happening. So as of right now, we'll wait and see what happens, but it, it doesn't seem like it's going to trend in a good direction anytime soon. And then let's talk about the Patreon flip-flopping story. So if you don't know, in general, I'm a big fan of Patreon. They're a fantastic tool for any business creator trying to create a more sustainable situation for themselves. Some creators use it as like this donation destination, others use it as a subscription service. Patreon themselves even saying what they're allowing people to do is allowing people to run a membership business for your fans. It's got a nice, clean front end, back end. It's what we personally use as our back end on DeFranco Elite. We use it as a place where we release videos early. They're exclusive videos. They're exclusive live streams. We also integrated part of our merch play there. We have exclusive posters, mugs, and Q1 
of next year, we're going even further. We're going to have a new show. We live stream it there. The whole of it will be exclusive there, but then we'll we'll cut it into pieces and release that on YouTube and all the other places we post stuff. If you're on DeFranco Elite, you, that's not news to you. If you're not, this is news to you. We see it as a small, modified version of things like Rooster Teeth first. So it's definitely in its infancy. And out of nowhere this week, Patreon announced, we're updating Patreon's fee structure. Here's why. Before this was implemented, we weren't asked what we thought about it. And by we, I mean both myself and my team, as well as just creators big and small on their platform. You think it's a good idea, bad idea, what, what do you think are some other solutions? None of that. And they come out with this post that essentially says, hey guys, you're welcome in advance. We know people that support these subscription services. They want, they want as much of their money to go to the creator as possible. So instead of the money that you put into the subscription service, you know, 5% goes into Patreon, 2 to 10% goes to paying the transaction fee, that percentage, because usually the fee is a flat fee and percentage. Also note there, the higher percentage, though the around 10%, you get those higher percentages when the amount being charged is low. So they say no more of that. The thing you're supporting is now getting 95%. We're gonna take 5%, and then you who thought you were paying a certain amount, you're also gonna pay uh, 35 cents plus 2.9% on top. And in general, in my opinion, this was completely messed up for two reasons. One, this screwed up the small creator. The creator is using this site as a donation destination where they're getting $1, $2 a month support from individuals. Percentage-wise, what those people were paying and then what they were going to have to pay, they were hit the hardest. Services like DeFranco Elite, which is a, a higher dollar tiered structure, not really hit as much. That said, because of this change, it looks like we lost around 300 people. You can't really see that completely on the front end because we've had a, a surge of new subscribers. So that was kind of infuriating, but but two, and I think the main reason I think a lot of people were angry is just no one asked what we thought about it. For a platform that seems to pride itself for not being YouTube. Creators first, everything else second, touting that the best thing you have are the creators on your site, and you seemingly didn't think to ask any of them what they thought of the, this change. Now, as critical as I am being in this video, uh, I was 10 times uh, more critical. Yeah, we'll go with the word critical. When I was on the phone with their CEO saying that I am going to get off their site very quickly. But the new fantastic news is Patreon has done something you rarely see a tech company do. They apologized profusely and canceled all the changes that they announced. And really, in an environment where you're a consumer or a creator, the company is usually like, fuck you, eat your peas, deal with it. But here it actually feels like someone's listening, someone cares, someone made a mistake, but then didn't choose to double down on the mistake. That is very rare these days. But that's my piece on that. And that's actually where I'm going to end today's show. And remember, if you liked this video, you like what I do on the channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Also, if you missed yesterday's Philip DeFranco show you want to catch up, click or tap right there to watch that. Or if you want to watch your newest behind the scenes vlog, click or tap right there to watch that. But that's it, of course. As always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you Monday.